Welcome to Alexandria, where history, mythology, and cultures come alive through audiobooks. Please subscribe, like, and comment to support us. Also, subtitles are available in over 70 languages. Just click the settings icon and choose your preferred language to fully experience the wonders of our stories. In this chapter, titled The Death of Darius, takes us into the heart of a crucial and defining moment in Alexander's conquest and the dramatic end of the Achaemenid Empire. As we embark on this chapter, we find Alexander at a pivotal juncture in his journey. He is no longer the young, ambitious king who set out from Macedon. He has evolved, for better or worse, into a ruler of immense power and influence. This chapter captures the final chase and downfall of Darius, setting a profound backdrop to the complexities of power, betrayal, and the inexorable march of Alexander's ambition. Stay tuned for an enthralling narrative experience, and remember to subscribe to our channel for more captivating stories from the past. Chapter 10. The Death of Darius. B.C. 330. Alexander's journey from Susa to Persepolis was not just a regular journey, but rather a victorious and celebratory one. He felt a strong sense of pride and happiness that naturally comes with success. As he grew in greatness and power, he started to lose the moderation and restraint that he had shown in his earlier years. He became intoxicated with his success, leading to arrogance, self-centeredness, whimsical behavior, and cruelty. As he approached Persepolis, he considered the fact that this city served as the capital and heart of the Persian Empire, making it the origin of all Persian hostility towards Greece. Therefore, he believed it was necessary to punish Persepolis in a substantial manner. Although the people did not resist his entry, he entered with his army and allowed the soldiers to freely kill and loot. Another notable example of Alexander's unpredictable and careless behavior emerged shortly after he had conquered Persepolis. He hosted a grand feast for his friends, army officers, and notable Persians who had surrendered to him. One of the women present at the feast was Thais, who was both beautiful and talented. Alexander chose Thais as his favorite and companion, despite her not being his wife. During the feast, Thais did everything she could to charm and please Alexander. She was lively, witty, and gave him clever attention while showcasing her charms. Finally, when both Alexander and the other guests were intoxicated with wine, she asked him for permission to personally set fire to the grand palace of the Persian kings in the city. Thais was from Attica, a kingdom in Greece with Athens as its capital. Xerxes, who had built the magnificent palace of Persepolis, had previously attacked Greece and destroyed Athens. Now, Thais wanted to burn Xerxes's palace in Persepolis to satisfy her desire for revenge. She planned to turn the fire into an evening show to entertain the Macedonian group after their dinner. Alexander agreed to the proposal, and the entire company moved forward. They took the torches from the banqueting halls and went out, causing alarm in the city with their loud shouts and the lights they carried. Thais's plan was executed completely, with every partially drunk guest helping by setting fire to the huge pile wherever they could reach it. They carried out the cruel act with shouts of revenge and joy. However, there is something very serious and terrifying about a big fire at night, and very few arsonists can look at the rage of the bright and scary flames that they have made go up without feeling some doubt and regret. Alexander was shocked by the magnificent and breathtaking yet horrifying scene. He felt regretful and decided to put out the fire, but it was already too late. The palace was destroyed, and Alexander's reputation and fame were forever tainted. However, despite the growing signs of arrogance and harshness, Alexander still displayed some of the qualities that had initially made him popular at the start of his journey. He adored his mother and regularly sent her gifts from his ever-growing wealth. She was a strong-willed and difficult woman, causing Antipater, whom Alexander had entrusted with the command of Macedon, numerous problems. 
She wanted to have control over the government, and she kept asking for it. Alexander didn't agree to her requests, but he treated her well and patiently listened to her complaints and insults. Once, he got a long letter from Antipater, filled with complaints about her. However, after reading it, Alexander said that although the charges were serious, just one tear from his mother would outweigh 10,000 accusations like these. Olympias used to write to Alexander often. In these letters, she would criticize and discuss his actions and comment on the characters and actions of his generals. Alexander kept these letters very private and never showed them to anyone. One day, though, while he was reading one of these letters, Hephaestion, the personal friend and companion who has been already mentioned several times, came up half playfully and started to read along. Alexander continued speaking, allowing Hephaestion to read. After the letter was finished, Alexander took his signet ring off his finger and pressed it against Hephaestion's lips as a sign to keep quiet and keep it a secret. Alexander was very kind to Sisigambis, the mother of Darius, and also to Darius's children. He didn't set these unhappy prisoners free, but he treated them with great kindness and thoughtfulness in every other way. He called Sisigambis his mother and gave her many presents. These presents were taken from her son, but it was believed at that time that he had the right to take them. When he arrived in Susa, he settled Sisigambis and the children there in a grand manner. This was their usual place to stay for most of the year, except when they were in Persepolis, so they felt comfortable and familiar here. Ecbatana, as mentioned before, was located further north in the mountains. After the Battle of Arbala, Alexander went to Babylon and Susa, while Darius escaped to Ecbatana. Darius was currently in Ecbatana, while his family stayed at one of the royal palaces under Alexander's control. He had about 40,000 men with him, who were still loyal to him despite his defeat. This group included several thousand Greeks, who he had gathered from Asia Minor and other Greek lands, and who he had recruited by paying them. Darius gathered his army officers and told them about his decision regarding his future actions. Many of those who used to be my government officers have left me during my difficult times and joined Alexander's side. They have given up to him the towns, citadels, and provinces that I trusted them with. You are the only one who remains loyal and true. As for me, I might surrender to the victor and let him appoint me as a governor of a province or kingdom under his control, but I will never accept such a humiliation. I may die in the fight, but I will never surrender. I will not accept a crown given by someone else, and I will not give up my right to rule over the empire of my ancestors until I die. If you agree with me on this decision, let's take strong action. We have the ability to stop the harm we are experiencing or to seek revenge. The army responded very warmly to this request. They said they were prepared to follow him no matter where he went. However, all this excitement and support turned out to be misleading and not real. A general named Bessus, along with some other officers in the army, came up with a plan to capture Darius and make him a prisoner. After that, Bessus would take command of the army. If Alexander were to chase after Darius and have a good chance of catching and defeating him, then he believed that he could surrender Darius as a captive in exchange for freedom, safety, and possibly generous rewards for himself and his allies. If, however, they managed to strengthen their own army enough to confront Alexander and eventually force him to retreat, then Bessus would take over the throne and get rid of Darius by either assassinating him or imprisoning him in a distant and secluded castle for the rest of his life. Bessus shared his plans, very carefully at first, with the top officers of the army. The Greek soldiers were not involved in the plot. However, they heard and saw enough to make them suspect what was being prepared. They told Darius to trust them more, to let them protect him, and to set up his tent where they were camped. But Darius said no to these suggestions. 
he said he would not lose faith in and leave his fellow citizens, who were his natural defenders, and rely on people he didn't know. He said he would not betray and abandon his friends based on the expectation that they would do the same to him. Meanwhile, as Alexander moved closer to Ecbatana, Darius and his troops withdrew from the city and headed eastward through the large area of land located south of the Caspian Sea. In this area, there is mountainous terrain with a narrow passage that Darius needs to traverse. This passage was called the Caspian Gates, named after the rocks on both sides. The army marching through a narrow and dangerous defile like this always causes delay and takes longer. Alexander hurried forward, hoping to catch up with Darius before he reached it. He moved so fast that only the strongest and toughest of his army could keep up. Thousands of individuals, exhausted from their efforts and hard work, were left behind. Many horses also collapsed from the heat and fatigue along the road, unable to continue and eventually perishing. Alexander urgently continued with all who could still follow. Unfortunately, it was pointless. By the time he reached the pass, it was already too late. Darius had already passed through with his entire army. Alexander decided to take a break and wait for his men to catch up. He then camped for a few days to send out small groups to search for food for the horses. These groups were sent to explore the nearby area and find grain and other food. Food for the horses of an army is too large to be transported long distances, so it must be gathered each day from the nearby area along the route. While waiting for the foraging parties to return, a Persian nobleman came to the camp and told Alexander that Darius and his forces were camped about two days' march ahead. He also mentioned that Bessus was in charge now, as the conspiracy had succeeded and Darius had been removed from power and taken as a prisoner. The Greeks, who were loyal, realized that the entire army was against them, and they couldn't fight back. So they left the Persian camp and went to the mountains where they are waiting to see what happens. Alexander decided to start chasing Bessus and his prisoner right away. He didn't wait for the foraging teams to come back. He chose the strongest and most agile infantrymen and horsemen, told them to bring enough food for two days, and then left with them that same evening. The party continued traveling throughout the night and the following day until noon. They stopped until evening and then resumed their journey. The next morning, they reached the encampment that the Persian nobleman had mentioned. They discovered the remnants of the campfires and the typical signs left behind when an army has camped in a location. However, the army had already departed. The pursuers were now too tired to continue without resting. Alexander stayed here for the day to let his men and horses rest. That night, they continued their journey, and the next day at noon, they reached another Persian camp, which they had left just a day ago. The officers of Alexander's army were very excited and enthusiastic as they found themselves getting closer to their main goal. They were willing to make any efforts, face any hardships and tiredness, and take any measures, no matter how unusual, to achieve their objective. Alexander asked the residents if there was a shorter route than the one being taken by the enemy. They informed him that there was indeed a shorter road, but it passed through a dry and desolate area without any water. In the march of an army, since the soldiers always carry a lot of weapons and food, and they can't bring water with them, it is always important to choose routes that have water sources along the way. Alexander, though, ignored this thought and immediately got ready to move into the crossroad with a small group. He had spent two years moving from Macedon to the center of Asia, always searching for Darius as his main opponent and enemy. He defeated his armies, captured his cities, looted his palaces, and became the ruler of his entire kingdom. However, as long as Darius was free in fighting, no victories could be seen as fully successful. To catch Darius himself would be the final and most important step of his conquest— he had been chasing him for a long distance of 1,800 miles, moving slowly from one region to another 
and from one kingdom to another. Throughout this entire period, the power of the enemy he was chasing had been steadily diminishing. Their armies had been defeated, their bravery and optimism had slowly faded, while the pursuer had been gaining more and more strength from his victories, and now his excitement and hope were reaching new heights as the moment for achieving his ultimate goals appeared to be approaching. Guides were asked to be provided by the people, to show the detachment the way through the lonely and empty land. The detachment was supposed to be made up of only horse riders so they could move quickly. To make the corps more efficient, Alexander took away the horses from 500 cavalry soldiers and gave them to 500 foot soldiers who were chosen for their strength and bravery. Everyone wanted to be chosen for this job. In addition to the honor of being selected, there was a lot of excitement, as usual at the end of a chase, to reach the finish line. This group of horsemen were prepared to leave in the evening. Alexander led the troops in the direction shown by the guides. They traveled throughout the night. At daybreak, from a higher position, they saw the Persian troops ahead, consisting of infantry, chariots, and cavalry, moving in disarray. Once Bessus and his group realized that their pursuers were getting closer, they tried to speed up, hoping to escape. Darius was in a chariot. They tried to push the chariot forward, but it was slow. Then they decided to give up and asked Darius to ride away with them on a horse, leaving the rest of the army and baggage behind. However, Darius declined. He stated that he would rather put his trust in Alexander's hands than in the hands of such treacherous individuals. Feeling hopeless and frustrated, Bessus and his friends stabbed Darius with their spears while he was in his chariot, and then quickly rode off in different directions. Their goal was to make it harder for Alexander to catch them by making him uncertain about their plans. Alexander continued to advance towards the area that the enemy was leaving, and he sent separate groups after each division of the retreating army. In the meantime, Darius stayed in his chariot, injured and bleeding. He was tired, both physically and mentally, from his many troubles and sadness. His kingdom was lost. His family was in captivity. His beloved wife had passed away, having suffered from the pain of being separated from her husband. His cities were sacked, his palaces and treasures plundered. And now, in his final moments, he was abandoned and betrayed by everyone he had trusted. His heart was filled with despair. During such a time, the soul transitions from unreliable friends to a clear enemy with a feeling of assurance and connection. Darius's extreme anger towards Bessus was so strong that his hostility towards Alexander seemed like friendship in comparison. He believed that Alexander understood the struggles of a ruler and would empathize with his misfortunes. The kindness that Alexander had shown to his mother, wife, and children deeply touched him. He lay there, weak and bleeding in his chariot, waiting for Alexander to arrive. He saw Alexander as his protector and friend, the only person who could help him in his current state of distress. The Macedonians looked for Darius in different places, hoping that he might have been left behind when the enemy scattered. Finally, they found the chariot where he was lying. Darius was in the chariot, wounded by spears. The floor of the chariot was covered in blood. They lifted him slightly, and he asked for water. Men who are injured and dying in battle experience an insatiable and unbearable thirst. This is one of the most horrifying aspects of the situation. They beg anyone who passes by to bring them water or end their suffering. They crawl on the ground to reach the canteens of their deceased companions, hoping to find a few drops of drink left in them. If there is a small stream winding through the battlefield, it becomes filled and blocked with the bodies of those who crawled there in their pain, desperately trying to quench their terrible thirst before dying. Darius was very thirsty. It was the most intense suffering he felt, overpowering any other pain. When his enemies surrounded him and celebrated, his first plea wasn't for his life, mercy, 
or relief from his wounds. Instead, he begged them to give him some water. He had to speak through an interpreter. The interpreter was a Persian prisoner whom the Macedonian army had captured earlier and learned the Greek language in the Macedonian camp. They had brought him with them in anticipation of needing his help, and it was through him that Darius requested water. A soldier from Macedonia quickly went to get some. Others hurriedly went to find Alexander and bring him to the place where the main target of his anger and long pursuit was dying. Darius got the drink. He was really happy that they had an interpreter with them who could understand him and deliver his message to Alexander. He was scared that he would have to die without being able to say what he wanted to say. Tell Alexander, said Darius, then continue, that I feel under the strongest obligations to him, which I can now never repay, for his kindness to my wife, my mother, and my children. He not only spared their lives, but treated them with the greatest consideration and care, and did all in his power to make them happy. The last feeling in my heart is gratitude to him for these favors. I hope now that he will go on prosperously and finish his conquests as triumphantly as he has begun them. He said that if necessary, he would have made one final request. That request was for Alexander to chase after the traitor Bessus and seek vengeance for the murder he had committed. However, he believed that Alexander would do this on his own, as punishing such treachery was a shared goal among all kings. Darius then held Polystratus's hand, the Macedonian who had given him the water, and said, Give Alexander your hand, just as I am giving you mine. It is a sign of my gratitude and affection. Darius was too weak to say anything else. They gathered around him, trying to keep him strong until Alexander arrived, but it was all useless. He slowly got weaker and eventually stopped breathing. Alexander arrived a few minutes later when everything had already ended. He was initially shocked by the scene in front of him and then filled with sadness. He cried heavily. Perhaps he felt some remorse in his heart upon witnessing the destruction he had caused. Darius had never hurt him or done anything wrong to him. But now he was lying here, being chased to death by someone who was determined and didn't stop, even though there was no reason for it, except that the person wanted to control and dominate others. Alexander covered the dead body with his military cloak. He quickly made plans to have the body preserved, and then sent it to Susa in an expensive coffin for Sisagambes. The procession was grand and fit for royalty. He sent it to her so she could see it placed in the tombs of the Persian kings. What a gift! The killer of a son sending the dead body in a splendid coffin to the mother as a token of respectful regard. Alexander continued his pursuit of Bessus towards the north and east. Bessus had regrouped his army and was trying his best to prepare for a defensive stance. He didn't catch up with him until after he had crossed the Oxus, a big river that flows northward and westward into the Caspian Sea. Crossing this river was hard because it was too deep to walk across, and the banks and bottom were so sandy and soft that he couldn't build bridges. He made floats and rafts that were supported by inflating skins or stuffing them with straw and hay. After crossing the river with his army, which had been greatly reinforced and strengthened, he continued moving forward. The generals under Bessus decided to betray him, just as he had betrayed his commander. They contacted Alexander and offered to surrender Bessus if he sent a small force to a specific location. Alexander accepted this and gave the command to an officer named Ptolemy. Ptolemy found Bessus in a small fortified town where he had fled for safety and captured him without much difficulty. He informed Alexander that Bessus was in his custody and requested instructions. The response was, Tie a rope around his neck and bring him to me. When the miserable prisoner was brought before Alexander, he asked him how he could have been so dishonorable as to capture, restrain, and ultimately kill his relative and supporter. It is interesting evidence that the fundamental qualities of human nature remain consistent over time, 
even as civilizations evolve. Bessus responded in the same way that most wrongdoers do when confronted about their actions. He blamed his accomplices and friends for the fault, claiming it was their action, not his. Alexander ordered him to be publicly whipped and then had his face disfigured, following the common practice of that time when a tyrant wanted to permanently mark his victim with shame. In this state, filled with suspense and fear of even worse pain that he knew would occur, Alexander sent him as a second gift to Sisigambis, to be punished at Susa according to her desired revenge. She tortured him severely, and when she was satisfied with his suffering, they selected four flexible trees, spaced apart, and bent their tops toward the center point between them. They tied the tired and dying Bessus to these trees, one body part to each tree. Then they let go of the trees, and the trees flew upward, tearing the body apart. Each tree held its piece of the body, as if celebrating, high above the crowd gathered to watch. As we reach the end of Chapter 10, in our Alexander the Great audiobook series on Alexandria, we reflect on the dramatic and pivotal moments that have unfolded. This chapter has taken us through the final chase and ultimate demise of Darius, marking a significant turning point in Alexander's conquest and in the history of the ancient world. Looking ahead, we prepare to dive into Chapter 11, where we will explore the aftermath of Darius's death and the implications it has for Alexander and his ever-expanding empire. This upcoming chapter delves deeper into Alexander's rule over the lands he has conquered and the challenges he faces in maintaining control over such a vast territory. We'll witness Alexander's transformation from a conqueror to a ruler, grappling with the complexities of governance and the responsibilities that come with vast power. Join us in the next chapter as we continue to navigate through the intricate tapestry of historical events, political intrigue, and the personal journey of one of history's most iconic figures. Chapter 11 promises to provide a deeper understanding of Alexander's character and the legacy he crafted. Don't miss this insightful continuation of our series. Click on the upcoming video link or find it in the description below. Remember to subscribe to Alexandria for more historical narratives and support our channel by liking the video and sharing this video with others. Stay with us as we delve further into the fascinating story of Alexander the Great.